Hey hey, Marcus Ass with you here and welcome to episode 23 in our quick progression series. Today we are talking refueling. So first of all, before I get into something a little more exciting, we're going to talk about just your basic refueler. To start with, we'll extend out our solar panels and our drills. And you can see we've got two large batteries on this vessel just so that when it's night time we've got still plenty of power to run this thing. To convert our ore to fuel we've got our Convertertron 250, we've got a large holding tank for our ore, and we've got two empty fuel tanks underneath a large RCS tank and a standard Rockamax fuel tank. Also included is our surface scanning modules, we've got that on the side here and this will tell us how much ore is in the ground underneath us. Where we are here at the shores biome, we have 2.8% available to us. Obviously the higher the concentration, the faster you will actually mine the material. So we'll just start both of our drills harvesting here. And just so that we can keep track of what we're currently mining and what efficiency we've got, we're gonna drag these panels up and dock them to the side here so you can keep track of what we're doing. Now we'll just start time warping a little here just to make sure that our drills are going to kick off and have enough power with our solar panels. Typically one drill per Gigantor XL solar array will be plenty of power, especially in the distance that Kerbin is from the sun. We'll just kick off as well the Convertertron unit to convert the raw ore into fuel so we can actually make it convert monopropellant and liquid fuel and oxidizer at the same time. As we start time warping, what you'll see though is that our Drillomatic's thermal efficiency is actually dropping and that's because of the heat buildup is actually stopping the process being efficient. So for that exact reason we've got a few radiators attached to the side of our vessel here which we can extend out and as we extend them and time warp again you'll actually see that the thermal efficiency of both our Drillomatic and our Convertertron units is going to go right back up to 100% over time and this is what we want when we're converting our fuel. We want this to be as efficient as possible because it can be a slow process. So as we time warp here again, you'll see that our liquid fuel and oxidizer are filling up first. Basically they'll fill up first and then the monopropellant will start to fill up after that because we've got both of those enabled on the Convertertron. It basically just does one and then it does the other. So again, you need to have enough battery power to last you through the nights and that's why we've got a couple of those big batteries. After the monopropellant fills up, you'll notice then that the ore tank fills up and that's just because there's no space left for the Convertertron to put any fuel, so it's got nothing else to fill up but the ore tank. Now we've got Bill in the pilot seat at the moment here, and he is an engineer level 1. Now that's important, what we're going to do is we're going to revert our mission back to the launch. So basically we're back here at the start without any fuel in our tank, so we'll pop out the solar arrays, pop out the drills and the radiators and we'll kick this thing back off again. Basically what I want to do here is explain just how important an engineer is when it comes to fast refueling. Without an engineer sitting in your vessel it's going to take you a lot longer to refuel and this is because an engineer gives you a great multiplier with the speed of your drilling. What we're going to do here is we're going to EVA out Bill and we'll just let him drop down to the surface so that he's out of our vessel. <laughs> Switching back now and we'll have a look at how slow the fuel is coming in compared to what it was when Bill was in the vessel himself. So if we have a look here, you'll see I'm using the second highest time warp speed. So you can see there it's taking days just to fill up the liquid fuel and oxidizer tank. Now with the magic of video editing we can switch back to what it was like when Bill was back in the cockpit at the same time warp and you can see just how much faster it is. Now on the Kerbal Engineer wiki underneath the engineer page, you'll see there's a table here that actually shows you the drilling speed bonus you get with each level that your Kerbal is at. Bill in our case is a level one engineer, so he is giving us a nine times speed bonus, which is awesome. But if you had a level three, it would be almost double that again. So it's a fantastic reason to have good leveled up engineers. So let's build what I like to call the super fueler. We're going to start with a probe core, cup holder, and an advanced grabbing unit on the front. We're just going to put on an MK3 engine mount part on the back side of that. We'll grab the double segment MK3 cargo bays and we'll turn them upside down and stack three of them together here for the main core of the vessel. So we're going to add the large Convertertron unit and put that on the inside attached to the engine mount and then we're going to stack five batteries on the end of that unit. 
To cap off the end of our vessel, we're just going to grab another one of those engine mounts and place that, turned around this time, on the end. Now we can angle the camera so that we're back inside the vessel and we will attach 10 more batteries this time to the opposite side. So we're going to have plenty of power storage, but we're going to need plenty of power storage. Just a small empty fuel tank on the inside and then we're going to just add a couple of struts to make this thing a little more stable inside. Now we'll grab our large ore container and we're going to place that right on the back of that engine mount. This is going to be the back of our vessel. And just two small monopropellant tanks on the back too. Now this vessel is going to be pretty heavy so we're going to add some very large Rove Max Model XL3 wheels to the back and of course to the front of our vessel here. Just using the move tool of course to bring those down and bring them in together. So just duplicating those for the front and we'll use the move tool again to get those into position. And that's looking pretty nice right there so we'll leave those in that spot. So now it's time to start adding some solar panels to the top. We'll just grab the Gigantor solar array and actually we can probably make this a bit bigger. We'll split this whole thing apart first and we'll just add another segment in. I think we can go bigger with this thing. So continuing on, we'll keep on laying out those solar panels right along the top of the vessel. So we've got one single lot right along the top. We'll actually now put a mirror set right along the left and right hand sides. And just using the move tool on each of them there to push them up higher, just out of the way so there's plenty of room underneath. Now under each of the solar rays, we're going to add a large drill. And there's going to be eight of these down both sides of the vessel. And again, we're going to use the move tool just to bring them down so they're not sitting on top of the solar arrays. That won't be any good at all. Now we're just going to grab another set of drills just to put on the ore tank. And we've got the space, so why not? So we've actually got nine pairs of drills. Finally, we just need to add a bunch of thermal control system radiators to our vessel. We're going to pop one in between each of our drill units right down the vessel in mirror mode. So that's about it for the main drill segments of the vessel, but we're going to add a few little things to the front here. Firstly, an antenna just so that we can communicate with Kerbin, and we'll just add a surface scanning module just so that we can get a good measurement of the concentration of ore just wherever it is that we happen to be. So we'll save the vessel and we just want to add some action groups because trying to manually deploy this amount of units all over the vessel is going to be a real pain. So we're going to automate all this. So in action group one, we basically want to deploy all of our solar panels, all of our drills and all of our radiators in the one go. Now we're basically setting all of these to toggle and that essentially means that we can use the same action group key to pull everything back in as well as deploying it. Now for action group two, we're going to set all of our drills to begin service harvesting. We're going to set that as a toggle as well. And we're actually going to add an action group three for our Convertitron unit. So we're opening up the cargo bay just so that we can get to it. And we're going to set our Convertitron on action group three to toggle liquid fuel and oxidizer because those are mainly the fuels that we generally need. Of course, you can always switch these around when you need. So we've closed all that up now and we'll launch this thing. Now from our last episode, you'll remember that we returned our super lifter just near the launch pad and we didn't actually recover the vessel, so it's still sitting out there with virtually no fuel left in it. So we're going to send out our super fueler to see just how long it takes to refuel that huge beast. Deploying the grabbing unit ready to attach. And the one thing that you'll notice when using these wheels is they take a long time to slow you down and steer you around, so I've overshot that a little. So we'll just line ourselves back up again, just coming in very slowly ready to dock. And there we go there. Now it's very important with this to park it parallel to where the sun is going to rise and set. And that's because it's going to give a lot more energy on the solar panels as it comes up over the vessel. So we'll press action group one to bring out all of our solar panels, drills and radiators. There we go, that's a beautiful thing right there. All of those parts coming out all synchronized. So we'll hit action group two to start up all of our drills in surface harvest mode. So 18 drills now going like crazy, pumping a heap of ore into our ore tank. And the next thing of course that we need to do is switch on our Convertitron unit, which we'll use with action group three. Now you can't actually see that working because it's inside the vessel, but we can see it up 
as soon as we look at our fuel readouts and time warp a little. So everything seems to be turned on and working perfectly, we'll start time warping and we should now start to see liquid fuel and oxidizer filling our huge tanks here. So we'll just increase our time warp speed until it's the second highest time warp that we can possibly have. And you can take note in the top right of the screen there how long we've been refueling. So as we wait for our fuel tanks to fill up, we'll just take note of the path of the sun coming over the top. We basically want the super fueler to be in full daylight where absolutely possible. So with Bill Kerman as engineer, we've filled up the entire rocket in just 24 days. So retracting all of the drills, solar panels and radiators, we'll undock, switch back to the super lifter, and essentially we're going to be able to recover this thing absolutely fully fueled. So we'll just recover the vessel there now. So now you'll see that we've recovered 98% of the value of the entire super lifter and that includes the fuel, the full amount of fuel that we've just put back in it. So 866,000 in funds we've recovered. Now the fuel component alone there was worth over 170,000 in funds. So if we go into our vehicle assembly building, open up the super lifter with the habitat unit attached, we can just take that habitat unit component out of it just to have a look at the value. So full price this thing was 884,000 in funds. So if we do refuel the super lifter, we can return it for the entire price minus around 18,000 in funds. So of course, one of the main things you're going to want to do with the super fueler is put it on one of the bodies around Kerbin or even one of the planet bodies outside Kerbin. And this is going to give you some fantastic options for refueling. Now the super fueler itself is around 65 tons, so it's quite heavy. In this case I've made a fairly large booster to get this thing up to Minmus and the two side boosters are essentially fueling the central booster, they're going to detach first. So as our side fuel boosters run out we're going to detach those and... <laughs> uh, not ideal, let's maybe try that again. This time I'll throttle down before I detach the boosters. Now here I've picked a launch window where Minmus is actually crossing over the equator of Kerbin so we can actually launch slightly southwards and this is going to allow us to change our inclination as we're ascending. So Minmus has an inclination of around 6 degrees and essentially I've been able to get this right down as I'm launching here to around half a degree so that's quite a lot better and it's going to mean we don't need to do a full inclination change later. So there we go there, our central booster can now be detached and be made to impact on Minmus, while the orange tank with the nerve rockets will get us basically anywhere we need to go. We can of course pop out all of our solar panels as well, just so that we've got plenty of power coming in as we come into Minmus. And although it's very overkill, the orange tank I've got here, this orange tank with the Nerve rocket motors can essentially also get us down to the moon or even out to Duna and Ike if we needed to. So you may remember back from many episodes ago, we had a Minmus science base set up here. It's only a very small little vessel, but we're going to come down and use our refueler on this. We can use those nerve rocket motors to take off a good majority of our velocity and we've actually got a skipper engine attached on the central core tank just for when we need a little bit of an extra boost. Just coming up over the top of the Minma Science base and we'll switch on that central skipper engine just to give us a bit extra power as we come into land. So you'll notice here as I turn on the RCS that I've added a few Werner engines to the super fueler and this is just to give us a little more control as we descend onto a body like Minmus. Of course if you're landing on the moon or something with a little more gravity you might even want to put a few other little control options just to help with the landing. Just switching to the Minmus science base we're going to bring all of the bottom solar panels in just so that we can come in and attach properly without knocking the solar panels off. So we'll turn the super fueler around and we'll drive in to dock with the science lab. Now in version 1.2 which is coming up for release very soon, I know they've done a lot of work in the wheels area again. Now I'm hoping that some of the wheel work that has been done actually improves the way some of these wheels work, especially the Rove Max model XL3s. They turn very slowly and they make you accelerate and decelerate very slowly. 
So again, I overshot that, reversing up here so that I can turn back around and come into dock. Just before I do dock, however, I'm going to switch over to the Minma Science Base and retract the legs because for whatever reason, as soon as I ever actually docked with this thing, all the legs would just implode. <laughs> so I had to do this first. And there we go there, docked. Perfect. So, I don't know if my super refuel is going to be quite big enough to refuel my little science base, is it? Ah, uh, let's see. Start by opening everything up with our number one action group. And we'll hit action group two, of course, to start our drilling process to collect our ore. Now, you may have spotted before that our surface scanning module was reporting 5.61% for our ore concentration, so it's going to be quite a bit more efficient again than what we had on Kerbin. We're just going to start that process now, drilling away, and we'll time warp. Obviously, filling up our little Minma space was no problem. We've also filled up our orange tank there on the back of our super fueler. And as we bring in all of our solar panels and drills, we can then undock from the Minma science base and... Whoa, 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 whoa! Oh no! Oh! And amazingly, it hasn't squashed the solar panels. Let me see if I can pull this thing back up just using the reaction controls. I've totally squashed my flag. <laughs> that just goes to show how overpowered the inline reaction wheels are because I actually don't have any RCS thrusters on this. And the landing gear as well has probably just got a little too much force behind it. So I hope you enjoyed that video. If you have any questions for me, whack them in the comments below. As we sign off today, I'll show you why it's not a good idea to try drifting in the super fueler. Thanks very much to all of you that have subscribed. And for those that haven't, please do subscribe to see more. Follow me on Twitter at Marcus House Game, and we'll see you in the next video. So in we come here, just about to touch. And, ah, oh, bounced a little bit there. Just compensate there using the H&N keys to make sure that you can kind of stick to it. Stability assist off, it should pull it together, and here we go there, that is beautiful! <laughs> that is really, really awesome.